Good morning and welcome back to the Tech 23 Impact Circles. And for those new to the circles, welcome. Thank you all for joining today's conversation. How and why do big companies buy from game-changing startups? As is custom, I would first like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Bunwarung and Boiwarung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where the Slattery's team meets, works, and creates. We pay our respects to the elders, both past, present, and emerging. We're also aware that others are joining from elsewhere, so please do say hi in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Today's conversation will be led by Tristan Forbes, and she's joined by Jared Ford, Martin Carafilis, Georgina North, Craig O'Kane and Peter Williams. I would like to make a special shout out to the Tech 23 sponsors, Transport for New South Wales, Main Sequence Syro Innovation Fund, Oz Industry Entrepreneurs Program delivered in partnership with i4 Connect, Addison's, ASX, and Stowe, Curtin University, Cicada Innovations, and Evoke AG for making Tech 23 happen. Hi, Rachel, it's so lovely to see you here. Oh, hello, Adina. I love your your uh, nod to spring. Uh, hello, everyone. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and especially call out and thank our contributors who are helping to make these Tech 23 impact circles happen. Uh, now in its 13th year, Tech 23 takes pride in celebrating Australian innovation innovation and is all about amplifying the people and organisations chipping away at the big challenges we face. Thank you all to, to all of those who are Zooming in to be part of these circles. Please say hello and introduce yourselves in the chat and you are welcome to ask any questions or make comments as you like in the chat as well. The link to the Slattery's Charter uh, is found in the chat, which is really a, just a guide to the behaviour we welcome at all of our events. There are lots more Tech 23 circles planned, but there's also been a lot that we've already held this year and last year. So please uh, check out the recordings. There's so many wonderful things to learn um, from so many of the amazing contributors. And please do note that today's uh, circle is being recorded. Um, just confirming that we will be eavesdropping on the conversation um, and then we will be having a time for Q&A, then we'll stop the recording and you'll have the opportunity to um, have a discussion and meet other people of like mind. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure and indeed, Great honour to welcome back Tristan uh, to kick off this wonderful uh, circle. Thank you, Tristan. Welcome. Thanks, Rachel. And uh, these circles are great, and uh, it's fantastic to be here to talk about one of my favourite topics, which is uh, startup and and corporate or government collaboration. So it's fantastic to see so many people here that are keen to keep this conversation going. So this is sort of the second in the series of deep tech and uh, and uh, commercial collaboration. In the first session, we really looked at the landscape in Australia and we looked at a couple of winning models like the main sequence venture science model, for example. In this second session, we're gonna delve a lot deeper into the nuts and bolts of these relationships, um, of, of these collaborations and deals that happen between startups and corporates. And we're going to hear some stories from the coalface. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tristan Forbes. I'm a business strategist uh, that has been consulted to big corporates. But for, for the last you know, six or so years, I've uh, been uh, uh, working 100% in the startup sector. Um, I've worked in the last two years on, in, uh, for, as the MD of Civic Labs. And during that time, I was involved in 16 different corporate, um, in this case, government startup relationships. Uh, and I was involved really deeply in each one of those relationships. And it's, it's shed so much light for me on what we can do to overcome the blockers in these relationships. And I can very confidently say that without the Civic Labs team being in the middle of these relationships, most of them would probably have failed. Uh, so I'm keen to uh, draw on all of the insights of the panel and see how they've fared in their, um, in their separate dealings. So let's kick off, let's get started. By the end of the session, hopefully we'll all have some pointers on how we can improve our chances of success. Um, so it's great to have Georgina North back with us today. Uh, on the last panel, uh, Georgina shared a, a couple of success stories with us like uh, Prezian and Sighthive. 
Uh, today we'll be asking her about the innovation team she runs inside Lang O'Rourke and uh, how it, especially how it manages internal stakeholders because that, that can always be really tricky. We also have Jared Ford with us. Um, Jared is with CSIRO and he went on a mission to understand why corporates in Australia were not taking advantage of the incredible tech that's coming out of our research institutes. Uh, in his day job, Jared works with uh, one of the most difficult things to commercialise, which is infrastructure tech. So it's not surprising he went on this uh, quest for knowledge uh, and he can share the results uh, of this incredible survey, which is a, a very recent uh, snapshot of what's going on in corporate Australia. So can't wait to hear some of that, Jared. Uh, we also have Pete Williams from Deloitte here. Uh, Pete's got stories from both sides of the track. Uh, I'd go so far as to say that Pete's an evangelist for uh, startups, um, deep tech and other tech. Uh, he has helped shepherd so many of them into big deals with organisations like including banks, amazing, um, and, um, and Deloitte itself. So uh, it's going to be great to hear his insights from um, understanding both sides. Even closer to the cold face, we have Martin Carafillips, uh, the founder of um, Talita, uh, which is an automated um, supermarket checkout system. Uh, and he has wrangled through the reluctance uh, and actually secured deals with companies all over the world, even our own Woolworths in Australia. So I'm gonna uh, find my closest one so I can use uh, Talita to shop. Um, can't wait to hear your story. Uh, we also have Craig O'Kane with us. Um, Craig has an amazing story from his involvement with Everledger, but he's also been a representative for the UK and Queensland governments. And we'll be able to share some big picture comparisons of how we're fa faring to overseas economies. So let's kick off. Um, I'd like to uh, start with you, Georgina. Um, and this is where it all begins to be, corporate appetite. Uh, so um, Lang O'Rourke, is uniquely forging ahead with its attitudes and its actions in this space. What's driving that? And, and what level of investment are they putting into this? Thanks, Tristan. Um, so look, tech in construction is booming as it is in, in a lot of other sectors. And it's actually moving faster outside of Lang O'Rourke than it is moving inside. And so there's this critical driver for, for change if we want to be able to keep up and stay competitive. There's a lot of challenges in the construction sector around productivity, quality, safety that we uh, really want to tackle. And tech is going to be the only way to get through that. Um, but it is historically really hard to partner with startups. You know, they're, they're different cultures, different attitudes, operating at different speeds, different volumes. Um, so the way that Langer Rock is tackling this is we have a dedicated team uh, called the Technologies and Innovation Group, um, formerly known as Engineering Excellence. Uh, we have been around for 10 years and uh, the business has strategically invested quite a lot of money into being that translator and that um, partnership glue between the external ecosystem and the problems, challenges and opportunities inside the business. That's great and absolutely fascinating because Jared, um, this is a bit different to what you found from the survey results. Is that right? Look, um, the survey, which is called Thriving Through Innovation, which is um, something that is available free on the CSIRO website, um, was published in December last year. But the data that we looked at was about 100 ASX firms um, just before the pandemic, trying to understand what really drives financial performance from an innovation perspective. And one of the keenest um, findings out of that is that attitude matters a lot. So this sort of construct we called corporate entrepreneurship, which was um, this really entrepreneurial uh, posture for uh, willingness to take risks um, and try bold new things, as well as being innovative in the sense of trying to prize technology leadership as a competitive advantage and, and proactiveness for um, trying to stay on top of these technology trends and stay ahead of the competition. So those things, came out as um, the number one factor by far, uh, driving the financial performance of the, of the top 10% of the firms that we, we surveyed. So similar to what um, you're hearing at Lang O'Rourke, uh, that, that kind of um, openness and attitude towards trying to be first and using technology to do it is what's uh, driving real world bottom line performance. And 
Uh, there's no surprises there for me about uh, the successes that Lang O'Rourke is seeing from that strategy. Yeah, it's a shame for, uh, that it's not happening in more uh, companies in corporate Australia. Um, let's um, let's go to you, Craig. Um, how is this sort of our, our performance comparing to the UK, which you've got lots of experience with? Yeah, um, no, thanks, uh, Tristan. So um, I think when you compare it to the UK, there's a sense that the corporates just live and breathe, I think, innovation and a dedicated either innovation team or corporate spend uh, more perhaps than Australia. I think in Australia it is there, but maybe not, just not surfaced in the same way that it's lived and breathed in the everyday in the UK. Um, some examples I can probably point to might be companies like uh, Unilever or Vodafone or uh, BG Group, for example, um, where there are dedicated streams within their procurement offering to support innovation and startups. Um, and that we can get into that in a bit more detail um, if you wish later, but I think that um, there's, there's still a gap um, potentially in Australia, um, both in terms of the quantum of funding associated, dedicated to corporate innovation, but also the acceptance of it uh, more naturally in corporate Australia, whether that be in the ASX or whether it be uh, in the private um, companies as well. So you've seen this firsthand, Peter, and you've actually managed to overcome some of these challenges. Um, just to kick us off uh, at the early stage of the conversation, if you were to put it down to sort of one thing that's working for startups at the moment uh, in, in these types of relationships, what, what one sort of major or key thing would you put it down to? Yeah, I, I suppose whether it's one thing, I, 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 perhaps the best way I can answer that is to talk about some of the stuff that we've done. Um, and say, for an example, there was one uh, years ago called Green ID, which was an online verification services, tiny little startup trying to sell to major banks. Now, we, um, I, I was leading innovation there. I was still sort of the godfather of innovation at Deloitte. So, but we saw this and thought, you know, this is a fantastic thing where as, you know, we're moving to online only account sign up. But the thing was a major bank like NAB is very nervous about dealing with a tiny startup in something that is so important around, you know, anti-money laundering, know your customer stuff. So what what we were able to do was said to, we teamed up with Green ID and said, look, we'll be your go-to-market people. We'll also do all that support that the dreaded procurement people, you know, they, they will put startups through levels of bureaucracy and due diligence that they're not prepared for. So you've got this heavyweight um, process with, you know, a very small team. So we would pick that up because at a large company like Deloitte, you know, lawyers and you know procurement people and all that stuff are on dial tone you know so we could pick up and help them so a lot of that the opportunity that we saw was to help startups get into market with really innovative things but with Deloitte providing that sort of foundational uh, level of you know capability expertise and knowledge around you know the ins and outs of anti-money laundering and all that stuff so I think um, it, it's really understanding if you are a startup and you're trying to go for a big fish that the way that the big guys play and think and the level of due diligence that they want to apply to you um, is just beyond many. So, um, so I think mm. that sort of how can I actually, as a small company, deal with these large companies and not have the life sucked out of me? Uh, because, you know, oftentimes what you'll see is that you'll have an enthusiastic advocate within the potential um, purchaser, but their ability to navigate you through the maze of bureaucracy and risk and forms to fill in uh, is limited. So yeah, I, I think right. being able to find go-to-market partners who can help you out, uh, particularly at early stages, is a can really sort of lay a foundation for major success as time goes Fantastic. on. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. That's great insights and they're very lucky startups. But uh, that wasn't your experience, was it, Martin? Can you tell us how Talita landed its first few deals? Yeah, it was quite different. Uh, the founders, we, we spent a lot of time overseas uh, we, working across uh, Europe and the US where I guess strategically, uh, Craig touched on it, it was a bit about uh, knowing those customers and their processes, how they actually adopt this kind of technology really embedded into a lot of these businesses, uh, having innovation departments, R&D departments that are open to the type of contracts that are actually uh, quite uh, advantageous for a startup and, and also advantageous to the company themselves. So uh, we spent a lot of time overseas uh, working with large companies uh, all across Europe and the US uh, before coming back to Australia. 
uh, really with a, a product readiness level and business level uh, much higher than what we first started in the business. So that was our, our approach. So the overseas markets were sort of a little bit more accepting of you being an early stage company. And by the time you got back to Australia and you were more sophisticated, had all these case studies, you kind of had the credibility and the experience that Peter was talking about, but you had to earn it somewhere. Um, that's really interesting. Um, Jared, your research sort of pointed to the fact that Australian companies are more likely to uh, launch something that already exists overseas as opposed to starting something fresh and new here. Um, so that kind of backs yeah. that up. Yeah, there's there's definitely a preference. Uh, and I guess, you know, you see people taking pride in this, that you know, we adopt, really good at adopting technology. Um, and that's fine. And of course, there's the great examples of that um, in across a lot of sectors, mining sector, if you think about how everybody talks about autonomous vehicles, um, there's been autonomy in the mining sector for better part of a decade, a lot that CSIRO has helped do, especially in underground uh, mining. And so, of course, that's a strategy, but there's so much more value to be made from creating, co-creating. And so that's the real crux of what we were trying to figure out with the survey is why, um, why in fact, there's, there's not much more of this going on, because it's obvious that when you do it, you get much better returns. So that that's, you know, that's what we need to be trying to focus on as a, as a nation, I guess. And, but it's challenging in the, in the, in the heavy industry sector. So think about, I'll give you an example in the mining sector. Um, we think about new technologies. So CSIRO came up with this uh, uh, idea for cyanide free gold um, purification process. And so um, we try to go out and, and sell this thing to existing miners. And these are miners that have a hundred million dollar plus infrastructures that are set up to run for decades. And uh, we come with you know, a, a better mousetrap. They're not gonna be really interested in swapping over, right? There's no, there's no way to sort of get into that um, um, uh, business. So that, that business in particular had to pivot towards artisanal mining to get a better foothold because of course, small miners can't afford to run these big cyanide mercury kind of processes, but a big miner who's already invested the hundreds of millions of dollars in there needs to sweat that asset for, for decades. So there's a challenge. There is a challenge in getting new technology into our big uh, capital intensive sectors like oil and gas and mining, which requires a bit of um, thinking about the timing of that. So you got to look for new mines and new companies that are willing to try new things and perhaps um, can hang some hang their hat on the fact that got a new approach that attracts the capital they need in the capital markets to actually move forward so there's a, a strategy to think about how to get into um, yeah. those heavy industries and uh, actually those... uh, that reminds me of everledger craig everledger had a quite a remarkable strategy for uh, landing its its sort of first client or its or approaching its first industry do you want to share that with us yeah, so um, thanks very much. Everledge is a, a global company, um, nearly 100 staff globally with um, six um, centers around the world. So deliberately global from the outset. But the way uh, in which we work with private corporate sector businesses uh, is actually quite different and probably unique to a startup slash scale up company. We've got probably the opposite problem in that we have so many companies trying to work with us, we actually have to, you know, be selective and turn companies away. So uh, we work with Alexander McQueen. Um, we work uh, with very large uh, uh, car companies around the world. Uh, we work with diamond businesses and we started with diamonds. So we, I guess we're a very disruptive company. We're a, a bleeding edge technology pioneers classified by the World Economic Forum. And with that comes a lot of, um, I guess, interest from the corporate sector. And by working with the diamond industry initially, uh, disrupting that 500 year old uh, sector uh, came with it, I guess, a sense of trust from other corporate relationships we then nurtured. Uh, and they were very intrigued and interested how we were bringing transparency and provenance to a very, very opaque supply chain. So I guess there's an example. Yeah. Of, of it was a great, yeah. It was a great way of dealing with a big, you know, the blood diamond problem and, and getting a lot of consumer support as well. So that was really interesting. But Georgina, um, how does Lang O'Rourke think about this? Are you investing in areas where you've got massive asset bases and 
Uh, are you thinking that way when you're innovating or are you going in different directions? Um, look, as Jared mentioned, like construction is also a heavy industry. The, the capex for large scale transformation is really hard and it takes a really long time. Um, so look, we've taken a bit of a different approach. Um, we know that, you know, this hard to with the incumbents and the, the, the challenges are really big. So we'll try and tackle them at the individual level. So we went with safety first and we went for, um, mm. we went with safety and we went with, uh, sorry, F, things have frozen. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Great. Sorry. Um, we went with safety and uh, so we came up with Toolbox Spotter and this was a really user driven um, approach for uh, a new technology. So it was uh, an AI computer vision system. Um, you know, it costs, uh, you know, a couple tens of thousands rather than hundreds of millions of dollars to get a prototype together. Um, and we were able to really test and harden and sharpen this tech in the field with people on the ground. Um, yeah, so uh, a bit of a one-to-many mm -hmm. approach rather than large-scale transformation. So, Martin, when I think of supermarkets, they invest a, a, a huge amount of money in their point-of-sale systems. Did you come across this kind of resistance and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of it comes down to the risk of working with startups and that sort of stigma that goes with working with a small startup. Uh, in reality, it's sort of how do you get that across as a startup that we may actually have more operating budget from venture capital. Uh, we have uh, IP and a bunch of different things that internally these large businesses may not be able to actually put towards this. So. Um, a, a lot of that is actually just getting across that, the, uh, hey, the, the risk is mitigated to a certain degree um, and sort of pushing the, the startup can actually progress uh, much further and, and quicker along the path than what uh, internally these businesses can do. That's great. Thanks, Martin. And that reminds me of a story that I've heard you tell, Peter, uh, about a startup you were involved with. Um, that initially the corporates were quite behind you doing it and then eventually actually decided maybe they'd go try on their own. Yeah, um, so um, I'm a co-founder of a startup called Packform or it's probably a scale up at the moment. We actually just closed a 15 million pre-OPO round uh, yesterday. Uh, we, um, we bootstrapped at the start and went jump through VC or we didn't do VC, we went straight to pre-IPO. So, um, but uh, yeah, the, the genesis of it was really interesting. We were asked by a large packaging company in Australia, me and a mate who was a sort of awesome entrepreneur uh, around a sort of digital disruption play in packaging. We said, yeah, no worries, came in, designed a bit of a business model, but, uh, and they were, oh, we're gonna learn from you guys as to how to sort of think and operate as a startup. And, and I said to them at the start, it's like, right, we don't do business cases. We do sort of prototypes, not PowerPoints. We do experiments, not Excel. Um, and if you want to learn for us, just, you know, go, come on the journey. But as it sort of got pushed down from the sea level down to the, the operating level, um, you know, they, after a couple of months, they wanted business cases and all that stuff. And um, then they said, oh, well, and I said, no, we're not going to do one. Uh, we're working it as we go. And um, anyway, so they then put us on hold because they went to Silicon Valley and somehow they had an epiphany or a sort of road to Damascus experience on the plane where they came back as a digital company. And said, oh, we're going to do it ourselves now. And we said, okay, cool. But, um, well, actually, we've, we've refined the idea. We think we might launch it ourselves. Is there any problem? And they said, oh, no, as if you guys could do it. So, um, anyway, a few years later, with um, <laughs> massively going, but it was just, you know, and they were sort of saying, like, oh, okay, why are you doing it with that tech? Why don't you use SAP? You know, and it's a bit like, well, your two year SAP project isn't going to launch for another year. We've got to move faster. But it was sort of, there was almost this willingness. But the organisational DNA or, you know, it just rejected this sort of method of learning by doing, moving fast, you know, being comfortable with ambiguity. Yep. And then they went back to no, no, no. And um, but yeah, interesting life. So we're flying it. And, in, and interestingly, we ignored Australia because we felt that the packaging market was more or less an oligopoly. So we went straight to the US and um, that's where all our sales in the US. So um, yeah, it's been great. So that's. Yeah, it's a really interesting story because it just sort of goes to the mindset within organisations and whether they really understand what the startup sector can bring and, and you know, what its superpower is. Yeah, so well, they know, want to do stuff, but they, it's yeah. just their DNA is, or the way that they're structured around risk compliance and all that sort of stuff just creates tissue rejection. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. 
Um, I, I think this is a perfect opportunity to delve into your innovation division, Georgina. So uh, how does it work and how does it stop the tissue rejection? Uh, yeah, we're one of those uh, biocompatible patches, right? So, uh, <laughs> our team, we're there specifically as those entrepreneurs that um, want to think like startups but also understand the way that Langer Rook specifically operates, um, but also that need to manage risk. Um, and so we've become experts at sandboxing. How do you quarantine um, financial risk? How do you literally corner off a section of a construction site to do a, a safe trial? And how do you get people excited? So that cultural piece right. is really important and that passion for technology and for Taking uh, your work seriously, but not yourself seriously, um, is a way that you know we're really able to engage with these early agile companies, um, but also kind of demonstrate, help demonstrate their value to the main business. It's a really fun job, really fun team to work in. So, um, how many pilots would you run every sort of month or year? Uh, it depends. It depends. It depends. Um, we look, you know, we do some. We work towards some really big ones. So um, if we're doing uh, an external spin out, like creating our own company, that one uh, could be as quick as six months or as long as, you know, five years. You know, Prescient was a big in-house deep tech um, development that, that we did. Um, but if we're looking at procurement, right, um, we're getting faster and faster at um, getting strategic partnerships with startups, being able to buy small volumes and with this commitment to scale up if we can validate the value inside. So, um, look, I'd say at any one time, we've probably got at least 100 plus on our radar um, and we're probably delivering around 10 impactful projects, um, you know, in one year. Fantastic. That is amazing. Thanks for sharing those statistics. I think it really brings it to life that you've got 100 things, you know, that you're kind of watching. Craig, if I can um, ask you about um, your experience in the UK market again, does that, that sound similar to the way you, the, the companies over there are running their innovation divisions? Is that their mindset kind of in their, their yeah. numbers? Yeah, oh, um, well, we can probably talk about this all day, which we are. So I'm really <laughs> pleased you asked. I think um, look, there's so many different examples. I think there's a few things we could all be doing to help drive this, this process. One, talk up innovation, support innovation. We're all champions for it here. But I think anyone listening um, that is, you know, a skeptic, uh, we need to demonstrate and show them, you know, what is possible. Um, so what um, Georgina was just talking about, if you look at, say, Rio Tinto, they've quarantined a lot of their information and their IP as well. It just sits in drawers. Um, I know from them that they're opening up those drawers to open source some of that um, technology, some of that latent IP um, they haven't got the time, the bandwidth, or some of the resource to look at it effectively. So is there a 50-50 sharing of IP opportunity for someone smart to come in, go into that drawer and see what else exists in there? Maybe there's some collaboration opportunities, but these are the sorts of things that need to happen um, in order to drive that systemic cultural change that we need to, to see uh, from intrapreneurs. Um, yep. I think maybe just touching on, um, I guess, the, the need for this. It's, uh, you can't always rely on, on, I guess, an initiative to come to you. Um, in the UK, a lot of the startups and scale-ups from Australia have gone there. And I just wanted to feed back to this group that Australian businesses, Australian startups, as Jared was saying before, um, are highly innovative extremely innovative they, you know some of these things have not been thought of overseas already um, and when they do go into markets where it's very accepting for an Australian company to go in like uh, Japan Singapore the USA the UK parts of the EU um, it's it's quite eye-opening for an Australian company to go in and, you know, and present and pitch and say this is what we've got because they will get a reception I think that um, those countries in particular are worth exploring more because mm. I just see the potential. I've, I've probably seen it with about, um, you know, 1,500 companies that have gone over to the UK mainly um, have had the red carpet rolled out for them. You know, if you're an Aussie company, an Aussie brand, and you've worked on your IP, you've worked on your marketing, you've worked on the way in which you're going to pitch to a corporate, just pick up the phone and do it. And, yep. you know, um, now's the time. 
I so agree with you, Craig. I know a lot of um, Aussie startups go to the US, but I just feel like there is such a massive opportunity for us uh, in the UK. I feel like it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant opportunity, the UK market. Martin, um, when you were approaching all these companies overseas, what, were there some companies that were easier to work with or, you know, they had like innovation departments like the one that Georgina is describing that would just embrace your company? Like if you were kind of going to give advice to a corporate that was keen to do this, you know, what what would they need to be like or talk about or or, or provide in order to, to make the relationship really, really collaborative and really strong? Certainly, yeah. yeah. Look, I, I think from a startup uh, perspective and, and something that we knew early on is to understand where both the startup is from a product level and, and a company level and, and where the corporate is as well. Has has the, the large business actually worked with an early stage startup or, or are they working with later stage startups? So I think this idea of innovation can occur on multiple levels. Uh, companies love turnkey solutions. If it's easy to get in, it's, it's a much easier way to sort of push forward. Some companies would rather work on a more bespoke solution, something that's uh, you know, fitted to their business, uh, something that they can use specifically. So a, a lot came down for us just knowing the customer, knowing where things like even say mm -hmm. budgets lied within their business, uh, where we were on financial years, where we were on certain uh, locations and things like that. Um, and, and really sort of coming back to what, what's their procurement process like, I think we find quite often that you can work for a long period of time on the front end of, oh, hey, validating this uh, technology and project and get to contract level and, and simply a startup can't sign that. It's uh, when you look at some of the, the penalties and IP ownership and things like that. So um, knowing that whole process and what companies uh, will work for the startup and for the large company as well, um, that, that was important piece for us. And, and we were able to sort of identify those and, and go down the path that fitted us perfectly. So would it be fair to say that you got uh, to the point where you could more quickly assess whether that company was the right partnership for you? And as much as they're looking at you, you're also sort of looking at them and whether it could work. Absolutely. I, I think the age old, uh, a fast no is uh, always a good answer. Sometimes you're, you're better off actually knowing that uh, it's not going to work than trying to push something that's uh, that's not. Yeah, I know you talk about this a lot, Peter. Uh, a, a conversation is not a conversion. Fast yeah, no it's, a um, thing. yeah I, it's funny just just on that point martin said about the contracts i i had a startup said um i think if i sign this contract i'm going to be put in jail you know it was just you know that big and um so so i think um what um and maybe just to sort of flip that slightly yeah we have these conversations and we have the enthusiastic advocate and you know we walk away yeah we've got a sale there but um what, what I see a lot of large corporates are doing, and there's a, a term we use at Deloitte, is avoid the complexitron, which is that um, we start these innovation initiatives in large corporates and then suddenly the risk people and the procurement people and information security people and all these see something O people who think they've got decision rights as to, to say yes or no. It just, it becomes overwhelming. So I think as a, uh, so as a startup, and that point, that Martin made about have you worked with an early stage startup before or whatever, that's a question you've got to ask. Because if if it's new to them and they've got the complexitron waiting to be unleashed on you, um, you might have this wonderful conversation, but it ain't going to convert. And th the other one I think that I, I think you can learn from Martin as well is this notion of the reference client. So some clients or customers are going to be innovative and willing to give something a try. Uh, a lot won't be. But if you if you can go and win, I don't know, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, and then you come back over to Australia yep. and say, Coles and Woolies will be, oh, well, they're doing it. Or we found with Green ID, you know, we got Ubank, we got NAB, and, you know, that sort of was almost like, oh, somebody else has done it, and they all roll in. So thinking really hard about um, when you have those conversations and it feels like it could be a conversion, understanding, you know, are they really that sort of visionary type client who's willing to go on the journey with you? Um, or are, do they want every I dot, every, you know, dotted, every T crossed and, you know, with gazillions of dollars of penalties if you don't work. So it's, it's what mm -hmm. I call shot selection. So have that conversation, but the next part of it is you've really got to refine it and say, you know, is this, how, how would you engage us is a simple question. Have yeah. you worked with startups at this stage before? Um, can and you give me their phone number <laughs> and find out from them what it was like? Yeah. 
Great idea. So there was a bit of um, your research uncovered a bit of this, Jerry, that um, there weren't that many companies that had worked with startups before uh, and that, you know, standard procurement processes were really tough for them to navigate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's just endemic that uh, a lot of, there's not a lot of collaboration going on between, let's say, the research sector where a lot of these startups come from and, and corporates. It's, it's pretty abysmal and we, we consistently track at the bottom of the um, OECD for those kind of measures. I, I think what's interesting about the conversation I'm hearing today is that um, you know it does it does really matter whether or not you can find a client is willing to go on the journey with you versus one that sort of wants to be an adopting of a turnkey turnkey solution. Um, and but anyway, I think we're interesting to, to, to this conversation. I, I'm kind of curious to see what the group thinks about this. Is that is there any instances where you've seen um, you know, like Georgina's group, where there's an actual function within the business that's purposeful, purpose built to engage with risky stuff and has mechanisms to be able to ring fence it and sandbox it. Um, but then also is tied into the core business so that when you prove something up, it has a pathway to get into the core business seems to be, you know, this is the fundamental challenge of innovation management for the last 30 years, this exploit, mm -hmm. exploitation, exploration problem that big companies have. And so to me, it seems like for it to work properly in a big company, you got to have a lot of people um, that are assigned to this kind of risk-taking group that has connections back into the relevant business units can actually translate and usher things through into the core business. And if you don't have enough attention of an organization type like that, you're just, you're just coming at, you're trying to find chinks in the armor otherwise. You just, you know, how do you really navigate those waters? I think it, that would all boil down to luck. And so you'd probably want to look for companies um, that have some kind of a structure. And I know companies like Woolworths, who we've been trying to help yeah, um, develop innovation capability, they doubt they even got a venture capital arm. Um, so you know, there's there's targets in the environment where you can start to say they're they're you know they're a little bit more savvy now. I should probably go there, and they probably have enough attention in the organization, sort of focused on exploring new risk taking endeavors, and that's a really important criteria to think about as a small business. So Georgina, how do you? Uh, integrate innovation into the wider organization because you've got the team there is that something that your team's tasked with doing yeah so look historically um we were really separate different office um you know dif different operating mode kind of like a google vibe set up away from head office um, but recently, you know, we've decided that we actually need to be a bit closer for that translation. We were really good at engaging with the external ecosystem, but translating it into bottom line impact um, was something that we could improve on. So we've actually grown a lot closer to the business. And um, Lang O'Rourke, we have, a, I guess, a defined process for innovation. Innovation is not just um, a, yeah, a thing that you do, it, it, you know, it's a, a way of thinking. Um, so we've been able to mechanise that, not just in my team, um, and working on those systems and structures for, you know, various go to market strategies inside the company. So which we, we, like um, we were talking about before, having an a intentional go to market with the Langer Rook customer base is something that my team actively works on. Um, we've also done a lot of work with lifting the um, innovation awareness and capability of the entire business so that they're empowered to innovate too as well as to bring ideas to us um, and be a lot more open kind of culturally um, to when there is an opportunity for a startup to come on site and um, and try something out yeah in my days at civic lab we found that we spent as much time sort of uh, teaching or, or spending you know a lot of energy with the sort of government side that didn't really understand what a startup was how they operated they didn't understand the testing methodology and the lean startup approach and for that startup to succeed they they needed to sort of understand all of that so you know it, it was really important to, to to really invest and to coach them through the relationship uh, so um, it sounds like that's what's happening inside Lango Rook as well have you found that in all of the companies and all of the startups that you've been involved with, Peter? Um, 
I, I, I would say the opposite. Um, so so I, I founded the Deloitte Innovation Program back in 2004. And, um, but, but interestingly enough, it sort of, it depends on the leader of the day, the CEO of the day. So mm-hmm. we've just got a new one called Adam Powick, who's a good mate of mine. And he, he has gone out and said, I want 50% of our revenue to come from partnerships and alliances. I want to drive right. the innovation culture back. And he, and you know, it, that tone at the top makes a massive difference. So um, yeah, and I, it, it sort of, uh, you know, so things like um, I'm, I'm playing a role as a innovation coach for things that are coming through, particularly around alliances or stuff that we're doing with startups. Like we've been doing one recently with one called Schedulo, a vaccine management mm-hmm. stuff, um, which has been fantastic. But again, how, how do we, you know, finding sponsors in the organisation. So we've got a well-established innovation function, but I think um, there are times when our innovation functions are sort of there because we have them, but there are times when the leaders are saying, you know what, we've got to go harder at this. And um, I tell you what, having been at Deloitte for 39 years, when you get go hard, go fucking hard as you can because it's um, <laughs> it won't last forever. So, uh, yeah, so I, I find that. But again, most organisations I see don't really have... A, a really strong innovation division. You know, we, we had a, yep. a spate of innovation labs. Everybody had to have an innovation lab four or five years ago and, you know, they then wane away. And so, yeah, it's almost like timing, strike while the iron's hot and take the bloody advantage when, when the doors are open because it may not be open forever. So, Craig, did you see this in the UK, this maturing of big companies um, where they sort of had sort of some innovation mm. theatre for a while and and uh, how long do you think it takes for a company to really get to a point where they're at Lang O'Rourke or beyond and they really understand innovation, they really understand piloting, they really understand startups? How long does that process take? It's a great question. Um, a lot to unpack in there. I think that um, maturity comes in many different forms and you'll always find some more willing to accept innovation than others. That's just going to be a given. Um, so it's around the culture. How can we change cultural acceptance of innovation to be, you know, front and centre of Australian and global corporates? There's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is to shine a deliberate intent on innovation through money. Put a lot of money in the in the innovation team, and then you'll find that the rest of the business decides to talk to it a lot more than it used to. <laughs> Rather than it being the team of thou shalt innovate over here, it becomes the team of money. And um, that drives a certain, you know, different type of behavior. Um, The other way is uh, in the way in which you run your corporate entity, which is um, to structurally um, embed innovation as a KPI inside individuals. And that goes across the whole company. So I'm sure that there's annual appraisal processes that, you know, many people have got and the big corporates have definitely got. But one of those, if they've got five KPIs, one of those should be bring something new to our company next year or do something in a different way um, Mm -hmm. to structurally um, equip um, the reporting mechanism at a granular level so that individuals inside a a company or a startup are undertaking innovation. Um, And with that drives a different behavior too. So it almost becomes a right to a veto. If that individual hasn't conducted anything to do with innovation that year, then they won't get their performance bonus or they won't get whatever uh, as part of their package. Yep. Interesting. Um, And going on from that, Martin, um, one of the things that Civic Labs did was we we really helped to shepherd uh, startups through the organization. Did you find any of the companies that you worked with would actually help you navigate their internal environment and they'd, they'd, they'd make sure your presentations were on a point and, you know, how, and, and that you were talking to the right people and that you were getting in front of them? Uh, what kind of things did they do and, and how, how significant was that internal navigating support for you? Yeah, I, I definitely think that we've had cases uh, where we've had a lot of internal help to move through different departments and different areas. And and uh, on the flip side, we, we've had uh, certain cases where it was it was pretty cut off. Uh, I think the biggest uh, or, or fast moving um, deals we get to, say, purchase orders and, and large sort of deals uh, came from, I guess, breaking down those big companies into smaller entities getting the assistance to understand that the unique value proposition is actually different for each of those different departments as well, uh, that whilst right, we have a certain solution, 
that may be able to help the business achieve their goals, uh, we need to make sure that those certain departments, KPIs, like what Craig says, are actually getting ticked off, that they're actually getting through because the key decision makers, often they're not the ones doing these calculations. They're not the ones that are sitting there saying, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, we have different departments that come through and say, okay, yes, we really want this technology. Uh, it works. These are the value props. We tick this off, goes to a decision maker that then says, okay, yes. So um, working through those different departments has been real key for getting across faster um, for us. Yeah, great. And I know you've got some stories on that too, Peter, but before I ask you about that, if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to put to the panel, you can um, uh, definitely start feeding them in. It'd be great to make sure that we're covering off whatever's burning in your minds as well. Uh, so Peter, you've done a lot of shepherding. Um, where, what, what are the keys to success of helping a company? Because I feel like uh, this is such a critical factor. The startup is never going to know how to get through a big organisation yeah. as well as the people that are inside it know. Yeah, I think the the first thing is to understand um, really, okay, and going back to Martin's point, yeah, let, let's say I'm introducing technology. Now, any sort of CIO at the moment is a bit like, do not put any more shit into my stack. I've got too much everywhere. So, okay, if it's a technology thing, how do we how do we make it sort of discreet or it's not going to stuff up or all we need to do is just, you know, send this data through this API sort of stuff. So, so it's really looking at what areas that, like Martin said, like, well, there's the sort of frontline people who might be store operations who see this is a fantastic way to, you know, move people for queues and all that sort of stuff. But then there's the there's the sort of what what does the introduction of this innovation mean to the rest of the business? And I, you know, I, I had one recently where somebody called me and sort of said, can you give me a personality profile of everybody on the exec? Because I'm pitching something to them. All right, this person thinks very much client only. This person thinks very much KPIs and finance. Mm -hmm. This person's very risk averse because that's their job. Um, you know, so the risk they'll be worried about is this. So you need to uh, demonstrate that. So I think, um, I think that, you know, having that person, and, and that's where I think innovation teams play a big role because we, we have to shepherd and get our own ideas through. And um, we know all Brilliant. of the sort of, the sort of corporate um, antibodies that exist and how to how, how to how to help them through the, the other one that I always use if anybody ever says no to me I always ask the question and well okay but under what circumstances could you say yes and Great then suddenly question. they're like oh well if I was if you could show that you know this and this and this are protected so because again you've got to think about it that you putting something forward to somebody who's tremendously busy and you've got a 15 megabyte PowerPoint deck in the email queue, which is like, I've got to think, but I've got all this other stuff to do. So it's a bit like, you know, helping them shepherd. And the easiest answer for anybody to an innovation, particularly if they're in, you know, one of those sort of compliance roles is no. Um, and, um, but understanding, well, what is it you're really worried about? Um, and that's, and that way you can actually address the real concerns, which is, you know, we, and I can help through that rather than think, and that's where, I think one of the things people underestimate in successful innovation is social capital. Um, if you've got, you need a connector, a navigator who's helping you through the organisation, who's got strong social capital, who can bring the people on the exec or whatever to make it happen. And I think corporates who um, are looking at innovation programs, don't put it off to some junior you know, whippersnapper who might you know, have all the design thinking qualifications and all that stuff. Who is that sort of corporate sponsor person, the navigator at a senior enough position with the right sort of relationships to make this stuff happen. Thanks, Peter. That's awesome. And we love that. Under what circumstances would you say yes? It's now one of my go-to questions that I'm going to use all the time. <laughs> I think we need to sort of move on to the IP area now. Um, and so Georgina, I'm going to throw to you because you have a really unique way of thinking about IP ownership. I know this is something that a lot of companies want to grab and hold on to and own, and but uh, you've got a bit of a different mindset. How, how does that work? Um, well, I guess coming back to this idea that the tech environment is moving faster outside your organisation than it is inside, competitive advantage becomes about access rather than ownership. Um, you want to be able to move fast and negotiating an IP agreement for something that you don't might not even know what the outcome looks like because it's innovation and it's uncertain um, really can slow you down. So. Um, I think being able to have, um, again, quarantining off certain types of engagements, certain types of partnerships where it's about 
just access and you you are as invested as the startups are into kind of seeing them succeed and develop their IP because if you get to use it then you get the benefit. Really interesting. Is there was there much that came out of your research in relation to IP, Jared? Just to put you completely on the spot there. Yeah, look, um, we didn't, um, I don't think we asked specifically about intellectual property in the, in the survey necessarily. Um, but one of the things from what, you know, experience is that you know, we did a, I did a, a report when I was at University of Queensland for the Department of Industry about how small businesses uh, struggle to sort of um, get into and use the infrastructure at the university level. So talk about the national imaging uh, facility, which is, you know, tens of millions of dollars of investment in medical imaging kind of kit um, that could help in everything from drug development to clinical studies. And, you know, one of the huge things that came out of that is the stance that the universities have typically with IP. So yes, of course, we have all this equipment you can use and we've got relatively recent uh, decent rates that you can pay us to access this equipment. But when you're sitting outside of the university system and you know somebody like the, the commercialization arm of the university says, nope, uh, we're gonna own all this IP uh, or we're gonna at least take a cut even just to use our equipment. Um, so even universities who are sort of supposed to be the sort of generator of new IP and companies sort of really struggle with how to use and engage with um, small mm -hmm. businesses. And even CSIRO is guilty of this ourselves. You know, when, when somebody comes to us, we'll, we'll often have a starting position um, similar to that. And so we, mm -hmm. uh, we're getting more savvy about that. I'm not disparaging my own company, of course, but you know, we all struggle with, and, and it's really about how do you maximize the downstream impact economically and where is the right, um, both who, who should own it, but where should it be licensed? What geographies? What uh, kinds of applications? That's where the money is going to be made. So you got to let one of the uh, one of the key things that sticks in my head from a um, medical CEO that when we were doing that study, it's like you have to let the IP breathe until we get to a point where we have something that we know might be actually useful, and right. then you know nobody's going to be held over a barrel, and you're going to lose all your bargain position. I mean, there's this big fear that everything's like the next Gardasil, or you know something that's this blockbuster um, innovation. And you can't go around thinking that everything's that important and tie it down so tightly that it never gets to breathe, never gets to turn into a real business proposition. So I think that's the real danger as a big organization yeah. needs to think. Got to let it breathe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think, you know, Pete, yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's, um, I find it incredibly frustrating working with government-based resource organizations uh, or unis where, you know, hey, I, I read a press release about some stuff you do, I'm really interested. Oh, do you want to license it? No, I want to find out more about it. Oh, what, what do you mean? Oh, I want to talk to you about it. Well, why are you calling me? Well, because I read your name on the bloody press release. Um, well, how much would you pay for a license? I don't want to license it. I want to see how I can apply it. I want to play with it. Oh, but well, what would you license? And it's like, for fuck's sake, mate, I'm trying to engage with you and help you. And you're, you're sort of looking at it as though it's all some sort of cash deal. And um, the same with universities. You know, I, I was looking up one about graphene fabrication. And it's like, you know what? This could be massive. Why don't I bring a few of my entrepreneurial mates in and, and let's just sort of tell us what you're doing. And I don't mind if it's a scientific level and we could think, oh, well, we don't work like that. Well, You've just said to a group of some of the best entrepreneurs in the country that you've got something really valuable, but you don't want us, you won't talk to us. Like, you've got to get this sort of understanding. If you're in this research game, it's like people are interested, but open the door, have a conversation. Again, a conversation is not a conversion or say, or we might say, you know what, we want to take this. Can we play with it? You know, oh, play with it. What do you mean? It's like, well, maybe just do some pilots and test application. Oh, well, you can't do that without a bloody agreement. So, yeah, and, and dealing with universities and IP, that's a world of pain that, you know, I have experienced and I, I don't go near anymore because I just find it too hard. And, and you know, no disrespect to university commercialization managers, but a lot of them have never done a commercial thing in their life. So, um, yeah, I think opening the door to the entrepreneurs and people who are interested in what you're doing can go a long way. But if it's all sort of put up with um, contract walls and agreement walls, um, you'll just 
scare everybody away. Not so, that I'm passionate I mean, about that topic. Yeah, I feel like if you could get your hands on things, Peter, and, and your uh, fabulous entrepreneurial mates, that good things would happen. But uh, I want to ask Martin whether anyone's challenged to you to try and uh, own some of your IP. But before we do that, Georgina, how do you guys manage this? Because there's different ways of doing it. You can, if you really want to own the IP, you can do something like you did with Main Sequence Venture and co-found a company. So is there some kind of way that you decide how much of the IP you, you want to own or whether you just want access? Like what's what's the decision framework there? Yeah, I mean, like every uh, company should have a bit of a, that buy, build or partner decision. Right. Um, I think the questions, you know, if you want to own, I think for Lang O'Rourke, I mean, the way that I look at it is it if it's intellectual property that is related to our core business, built, you know, buildings, construction, infrastructure, that's stuff that we can really own and commercialise ourselves. Um, but if it's going to be adjacent to your core, like a tech firm, it's, it's going to need to, like you say, um, be able to breathe. So I'd say um, there's... There's, there's so many different mechanisms that you can look at. I think also, as Jared was saying about um, being able to defer the decision, you know, give give, give it right. a 12-month way and have a check-in point of what do you do about any IP that you happen to have generated, takes the pressure off, you know, who owns it yeah. and whether you actually did uh, invent any or not. I think also, you know, it, when you're talking about uh, whether you're going like hard IP, like patents, or if you're just talking about knowledge and know-how and experience, I think, you know, patent strategy is potentially, you know, becoming a little outdated. You know, you can write a lot of patents and throw them behind you to slow your competitors down, but that that's not slowing them down anymore because, um, yeah, tech is moving fast. Yeah, really interesting, and it's a great concept, isn't it? Like letting your IP breathe. Did um, did anyone try and get their hands on your IP, Martin? Yeah, look, it, from time to time, this this kind of thing occurs. Uh, really, um, a lot of this comes from big businesses that probably just aren't as informed or don't have those innovation type departments or people within that business. Um, we, one thing that sort of um, we, we've definitely experienced in those kind of we're dealing with those kind of businesses. Uh, that really they will actually try to engage for development work. And, and I think um, everybody should be really understanding as a startup that uh, you know, if you are a startup, you're, you're not doing development work for these businesses. Um, otherwise, you're turning into a consultancy. You're giving off you, you, IP to these businesses. So um, right. just really being able to sort of navigate that world has uh, been really important for us. And, and uh, we've certainly seen that the difference between I guess uh, educated people around innovation and uh, and and just like Georgina says, there's there's a real conversation there uh, between what what the partnership looks like. Uh, is it a is it a purchasing agreement? Is it uh, a, a contract licensing rev share? What, whatever that looks like, um, both groups need to be open to that and and come to an agreement. So nice. Yeah, you've made it just sound really easy there. <laughs> All right. So we're down to the last couple of minutes. So um, if I could just invite the panel to just give us their final thoughts on, you know, well, what can we do just to just unblock this and to create better collaborations? Who'd like to kick off? Gosh, well, this Peter. has been, uh, oh yeah, I'll go first. Sure, go for it. <laughs> is, um, I think conversations like this, you know, um, Tech 23 is just a great platform to meet other people that are going through the same challenges and see the same opportunities in Australia. I think that's an amazing starting point. Great. Thanks, Georgina. Pete? Yeah, I, I think um, go share your stories far and wide if you're a corporate and what you're doing. The other one is share connections. You know, hey, I've got this idea. You know what? Might not be right for us, but sort of being an active player in the ecosystem at, with... with with the view of, um, well, I'm a Buddhist, so basically, effectively, you know, I give because I know the more I can give, the more I can help, it comes back in spades in weird and wonderful ways. So it's like, if you're yes. going to play in this space, really, I want the startups I, I help to succeed. I don't want their IP. I want them to be blockbusters. Therefore, um, you know, what can I do to help? And then the other one is, goes back to the, I think it was Martin who said the quick no, don't lead people on, you know, be straight. A quick no is much better than a long no. Um, so, yeah, just um, put yourself in the shoes of the startups and the researchers and the scientists and all those people and say, right, you know, can I help? And if, if it's not me, who else in my network might be able to, you know, give these people a leg up? 
Thanks, Pete. Martin. Yeah, I think uh, sort of just backing up, get the good stories out there. I think uh, the more that other businesses and startups hear all of those good stories, uh, the more that we can uh, keep pushing and, and keep pushing those uh, relationships and partnerships. So um, it's great to to hear some of these thoughts and, and hopefully we get to hear more. Great. Thank you. Craig and Jared. Craig. Yeah, um, I'd like to say, think, if you're a startup, think really strategically about the corporates you want to work with and think about almost a strategic relationship management approach. Who is who in that organization that you need to influence? Um, back to Peter's point, look at your own networks, use and stalk LinkedIn, try and identify who is who and who's going to get you best uh, way in in that business. Thanks, Craig. Jared. Yeah, I guess my advice is to the corporates to try and make sure that you're not trying to apply the same supply chain sort of uh, rigor to your contracts that, contracting that you would, um, that you're bringing that legacy kind of approach to a new engagement that's got mm. risks that you can't quite understand. I've spent so many friggin' hours agonizing on contracts around open innovation contests, for instance, where we sort of speculate that there might be some IP that someone might bring to the table and who might own that IP. And it's all this, you're just jumping in shadows all the time. And so you yeah. need better structures to allow something to germinate and not put strictures on it and not scare off um, the startup who's got a great idea that could really turn into its own billion dollar business or really help your business. And, um, you know, just, just have the right attitude even going into this and get some lawyers that aren't going to, you know, don't let the lawyers lead the, lead the uh, negotiation. It's got to be someone strong enough in the organization to tell the lawyers how to structure something that's going to be good for that's everybody. A, that's a great point. And I reckon that's uh, something we could have a, another whole session on. But I love the idea that there's far more to what your company is going to get out of a relationship with a startup than just IP. There's just, it's, ex, it's extremely limiting to just think about it in that way. It's been brilliant. Thanks, everyone. I've loved the conversation uh, and look forward to following up with you all afterwards as well. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, well, fantastic, Tristan. That was that was a really great session. So for those on the line, please share far and wide when the recording's available.